So, I don't know if you can read my shirt, but it says, kick fear in the face. And a friend of mine gave this to me, and little did I know what this shirt would mean and how it would become kind of the mantra of my life. I'm going to take you back two years almost to the day, March 27, 2014. It is nighttime. It is midnight. It is cold. I'm talking about the kind of cold that you could put on seven layers and you could still not get warm. I was that cold, down to my bones cold. I had been hiking and climbing for four days, almost 20 miles, eight hours, 10 hours a day, and oh, by the way, I was in a blizzard. And I happened to be on Mount Kilimanjaro at 17,000 feet, just 2,000 feet and some change from the summit. And we're on the way up and we hit this blizzard and we realized, oh my gosh, we're marching into a blizzard. Everybody else on the mountain went down that day. We didn't go down. And you know, there's these crazy people that actually go climb mountains for fun. I don't know if we have any of them in here, but I am not one of them, okay? Contrary to what uh, the nice gentleman said about me, I am not very brave. Um, I happened to be on the mountain for somebody else. I was climbing for somebody else. And his name is Kevin Turner. And he happens to be the bravest person I know. And if I was afraid up there, which I tell you I was, he is the exact opposite of that. The most brave person I've ever met. A family man, a father, a loving husband, just amazing. And no, by the way, happened to be a fullback at Alabama, was a, uh, a fullback and special teams player in the NFL with the Patriots and the Eagles. And he also won the Ed Block Courage Award. And guys, if you don't, and ladies, if you don't know what that is, that's voted on by your teammates, okay? In the locker room, nobody else gets a vote on that. So that means you were the most instrumental, the most uh, motivational. You're the leader of the team. It is one of the highest honors to be voted on the Ed Block Courage Award. So I met him. I did a radio show here in Birmingham, and I met him. It was a segment called Pay It Forward Friday, and we honored people in the sports world that were doing more with their life. And he came in, and, and he just captured my spirit. And he captured my spirit because he had ALS, and we just heard about that in another talk. Um, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And he needed a little help turning up the volume and uh, putting on his headphones. And I, I felt pity for him, and, and I didn't want to. And he started the interview and he said, I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. He said, you could step off a bus tomorrow, a curb tomorrow and get hit by a bus. He said, I got a heads up on my life. I say I'm sorry. I hug my kids. I live intentionally. And from that moment forward, he stole my heart. Fast forward a couple of years and fundraisers in between, and I find myself up on Kilimanjaro for this man. Myself and eight other people decided to climb Kilimanjaro. We named it Climb for Kevin. We're going to climb up this mountain for awareness and to bring uh, funds and awareness to a disease that by the way, uh, there is no cure. There is no stop in the progression. As our speaker said earlier, it is debilitating times 10, right? So your mind stays intact, okay? Your body, you become entombed in your own body. So your motor neurons stop talking to your muscles and then your muscles atrophy, they die. So all the time this is happening, your brain is perfectly functioning, but you're looking at this going, hand open, hand open, hand open, and your hand stops opening. And then you go, raise your arm, raise your arm, and you can't raise your arm. And then it eventually becomes where you can't breathe, where you can't swallow, and your mind stays completely intact in all of this. And so to say it's a debilitating disease, to say it's a heartbreaking disease is literally uh, an understatement. And we decided to climb this mountain for this man, to honor him, 
to do something amazing for this brave man. So we find ourselves at 17,000 feet, right? We're up there, and I was terrified. There's no other way around it. You, you, you can't come back down after 17,000 feet. There is no, there's no option to come back down. We got to base camp around 12 o'clock that day. They told us to go bed down. Go bed down, take a little rest, just take a little nap, have a little something to eat. As if you can rest. You're at 17,000 feet, you're in a blizzard. Who can rest during that? And they said, we'll take off at midnight. Okay, so midnight, you get up, you put the rest of the layers of your clothes on because you can't keep warm. There's nothing you can do to keep warm. And they give you a little headlamp and it's pitch black at night and you're gonna go to 19,341 feet, right? And so there's three routes up Kilimanjaro, just so you know, there's one called the Coca-Cola route. And they named it that because literally you can drink Coca-Cola and smoke cigarettes the whole way up. It's that easy. I mean, literally, it's that easy. You just stop in some huts and have a Coca-Cola and have a smoke and then you walk for a little bit more. It's that easy. There's another one called Barafu, okay? It's up the back side of Kilimanjaro. And that one's kind of switched backing up. And then there's the Western Breach, and it's the Mac Daddy of them all, okay? And when we were thinking about routes that we could go up Kilimanjaro, there was really no way for us to go other than the Western Breach, if you think about it. Kevin and everybody that he has fought for fights a mountain of ALS every day, so how could we take any other route besides that route, right? So we're marching, we're marching, we're walking, we're walking, and we have this headlamp, and the headlamp really only, it only illuminates like two feet in front of you. And I remember thinking, thank God, it only illuminates two feet in front of you. Because if I could see what was around me, I, I mean, I don't know what I, you know, I don't know what I'd do. I don't know that I'd be here to talk to you about this. So I kind of have this theory that they make you go at midnight in the dark and they make you go with only a headlamp so that you don't know what's around you. And so off we go, we're walking. And keep in mind, we're in a blizzard. We have no ropes, no crampons, no special shoes, nada. We were not prepared for this. Everybody else went down. We were the only ones to go up. And so we're walking, 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 and we get to what I can only describe as a wall, a massive wall. And the, and the Western Breach was actually closed a couple of years ago because of falling rocks. It fell on some climbers' head and it killed them. So it is a, a sheer rock face that is straight up and down. It's rocks and scree at best. Now it's now got snow and sleep on it. There is no uh, route, right? There is no trail. You are just following. The guides are making a trail and you're stepping behind them. And they had put like two more guides on our climb uh, that morning because of the treacherous conditions. They put just a couple extra there. And so you're stepping and you're stepping ahead of them and you're just, you're following. That's all you can do. That's all you can see. And I went to step and I stepped through. And all of a sudden I hit my chest and I can, the way I remember it is it was a whimper. It was like, ah. I mean, people say your life flashes before your eyes. I didn't have time for my life to flash before my eyes. In a moment's notice, I was sliding on my chest, on my stomach. And what was I sliding? Towards oblivion, off the side of this mountain, in the middle of the night. And I just, I, you know, the, you don't, you don't have, I'm just whimpering. I mean, that's literally the, nothing, nothing dramatic. I'm like a child, I'm whimpering, okay? So I'm sliding and I know what's down there. And all of a sudden at the last moment, I feel this arm come out for me. And I look over and I have managed to start crying too in the middle of this. And I look over and I'll never forget this guy's face. It was this big toothy grin. And he was like in some African language Swahili or something like, I got you. And it was this big toothy grin. And, and he was, you know, like this was normal procedure for him, right? And so they take my backpack off of me and one person walks in front of me and one person walks behind me. And what I can tell you is this, I became childlike. 
I started to sing hymns that I haven't sang since I was four or five years old. I didn't even know I remembered those hymns. That's all that my little brain could process at the time. And forgive me for being so foul. I do work with men, but forgive me for being so foul. In that moment, I was just literally trying to control my bowels. I was trying not to go number two on myself. I was like, if I can just get up this mountain, you know, this will be good. And I'm singing hymns. I'm sort of catatonic. I'm just... You know, and then in the process of this, another girl goes down. Another girl goes down. She gets ice axe arrested. Another guy goes down with her. They find him underneath her, okay? He risked his life. They go get her. We keep going. And then, by the way, this all happened 20 minutes into the Western Breach. So there's another six hours of this, climbing like this, before you get to the summit. So we get up. We finally get to the first. And we walk for a while, and there's another... Uh, set of switchbacks and I'm talking about I was so hungry no energy bar was gonna get what what I had like no energy bar was gonna get that my lips were blue you know I I am I am saying prayers and hymns and somehow something down in me and now I know what it was it was Kevin willing us on it was Kevin that will within me willing us on and somehow with him, with us, we were able to make that summit, 19,341 feet. Now listen, airplanes fly at 30,000 feet. Airplanes, like literally almost 10,000 feet higher, and you're cruising up in your airplane up there. That's how high we were. We couldn't stay up there long. Lips blue, they're trying to give us soup. We keep going. We go another 10 hours down. It's an 18-hour day. Back to base camp, back to 10,000 feet. So up 17,000, 19,000, all the way back over to uh, 10,000. And what I learned that day was a couple of things, a couple of big things I learned that day. Is one, you've got to make your purpose greater than your fear. Because it would have been really easy up there for me to let that fear just absolutely, totally consume me, be done. But here's the really profound thing I learned, and I was dying to share it with you today. That oftentimes, our greatest blessing is right smack dab in the middle of our fear. The thing that we fear the most, sometimes it might be dying, it might be getting sick, it might be getting fired, it might, it, it, I don't know what your greatest fear is, but I can tell you this. I bet your blessing, your greatest blessing, is wrapped up in that greatest fear. And will you go get it? The other thing that I, I figured out is you got to have the faith to keep going in the dark. When you're freezing, when you're cold, when there's nothing in you but the will. But Kevin, for me, that says to keep going. And I also learned, I also learned that when you do it for somebody else, when you're doing something, as our other speaker said, small or large for somebody else, there's something to that, ladies and gentlemen. There's something to a life when you serve and you're doing something else. And you know, Kevin, he taught me about bravery. He taught me about facing your greatest fears. And I want to show you a little clip of Kevin and what he talks about his blessing and his greatest fear. And man, so mean, wonderful people, only my home, and ALS, and that more than anything has. And swinging my faith in God and I just know there is a plan. So two dates are significant. And I want to tell you a story about Kevin. Two dates are significant. One, it was two years to the day that we were on the mountain, that we were summoning. Um, the woman 
that you're seeing that you saw in the pictures with Kevin, she was his nurse. She only met him because he was diagnosed with ALS. They fell in love and they got married. One of his greatest blessings, other than his children, was because he had ALS. And the other date that's significant is that one week ago, my friend Kevin Turner lost his battle with ALS. So I wanna ask you, because I have this feeling that in this room, there are people that have the next great novel in them. The next big executive is in this room. The next big inventor is in this room. But I wonder, will you be brave enough to face your fears and get your blessing? Because Kevin was. So again, so I can leave you with these life lessons that he taught me because you know what? That was the greatest blessing. I don't have kids yet. I've had a, a career of wonderful first, but being up on that mountain for somebody else and getting outside of myself and doing something that utterly terrified me and almost dying for somebody that I never wanted to or never could repay me was the greatest blessing in my life. And I had to learn, as Kevin taught me, to make my purpose greater than my fear. I had the faith to keep going, even where things were really dark. And I also was doing it for somebody else. And I recognized that my greatest blessing after I got down was wrapped up in my greatest fear. And here's what I know. We're all on the Western breach, if you think about it. The Western breach of life. It's dark, it's midnight, scared, don't know when you're gonna eat again, don't know you're gonna get out alive, but we're here for each other. We're here to take care of each other. And what I think Kevin would want you to know, speaking through me tonight, is to be brave, to be brave like Kevin. Thank you.